peardeckpodcast.com and enter the code in the upper right corner. Uh, we're going to use Pear Deck today, like Becky just mentioned, as a way to interact with each other and gather some feedback. So feel free to get that set up now as you wait. Is that your daughter? Is she singing? So we will get started in one minute, but as you wait for that minute to come, please join us in Pear Deck. So following the directions that you see on the screen, go to joinpd.com. And then in the upper right corner of my screen, you'll see um, five letters and that's the code to join our Pear Deck. And that's how we'll interact throughout the presentation today. Once you get there, we have some questions that we would love to see your responses to. Okay, it is 12 o'clock, so we are going to get started. Um, for this presentation, we would love for you to join us by opening another tab in your browser and going to joinpd.com and then type in the code VWIAL. So we're using Pear Deck today and you'll be able to see the presentation. And also we have some interactive formative assessment type features built in uh, as a way for us to stay connected. I just put this information into the chat. So um, when I go to the next slide. You won't be able to see the directions here on my screen, but it is in the chat. So let's see the responses. Let's see who is here today. So we have people joining us um, from St. Cloud. I'm just right outside of St. Cloud. We'll talk more about where we're from. So thanks for coming. Elk River, uh, pre-K, wonderful. I Kindergarten is where I love to live. Uh, fourth grade, I see some people have done some work with research projects, um, animal research projects. It's probably my favorite research project I ever did. A student created something on the Arctic fox, and we'll talk about it later. And that one always stands out to me. Um, oh, so originally, where are you from? You could say originally or right now, however you want to choose to answer that. Great, I see a lot of elementary grades. Some combos. Okay, we will get started. So if you are joining us, you're here today for our presentation on primary and elementary ed tech tools for hybrid learning. And Becky and I are going to share our resources that we've used for doing research projects with students. So our presentation will go till about 1245 and we'll have time for some questions as well. So to get started, my name's Angie. I, I, I recognize some of the names in this room. I was a teacher in the St. Cloud School District for many years. I taught EL and then was tech integration. Last year, I moved to Boston to work at Tufts University with the DevTech Research Group and really focus on computer science and computational thinking. It's where Scratch Junior and Kibo were created, and I loved it but realized that Boston's a little bit too far away, um, especially now with not travel not being the easiest. So I, I moved back um, about two months ago now, three months ago, and I started a new job as a product manager at Capstone, 
Uh, so I'm based back here in Minnesota. So if we were at in-person events, I'd be excited to see everyone again. Um, but we're online, so I'm excited to see your pictures. Um, and during the last year with distance learning, I was teaching at Tufts University. So I was working with adults, um, not necessarily the youngest students. We have a lab, we had a, there is a lab school there. So I got to work with some students that way, but mainly adult learners. And I'll let Becky introduce herself. Hi, I'm Becky Hansen, and I teach elementary computer computer science in Texas, and I'm a technology integration specialist as well. And during distance learning, I sent out a STEM newsletter, and I did uh, keeping the connection by weekly Google Meets lessons. And what are we using today, Becky? Oh, we're using Pear Deck, and it is an add-on for Google Slides. And I just saw that the link uh, for the presence late the link for the presentation slides just takes me back to the sketch page. I'm going to put it in the bit.ly. Jennifer, are you, which link were you talking about? Did I link it wrong in sketch or is it the link that you see on the screen? You can, you can type it in the chat. We'll keep going. Okay, so how do I know Angie? This past uh, spring, I went to Infosys Winter Summer uh, Winter Institute, and it was in Rhode Island, and she taught the Scratch Junior and Kivo class, and I was there, and that's where I met Angie. And where are you located, Becky? I'm in Texas. Yeah. In Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, and I'm in central Minnesota. And a lot of the people in the presentation are in central Minnesota. So just goes to show how cool it is to be able to use Zoom to present with people from all over. Um, it's not a barrier for us anymore, which is exciting. But if you're interested in more free PD, check out the Infosys Foundation Pathfinders Institute. I went as a attendee a few years ago and then presented at it. Um, I was able to get a lot of my funding done through Donors Choose and I got to spend a week learning about computer science at my specific grade level. So it was a pretty great experience. And like Becky said, this, we met in the winter, but they just had one this summer and it was all online. So they're trying to still bring that PD, um, even if we can't be in person. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the five steps to inquiry-based research. And we're going to show you a bunch of different ed tech tools our goal is not to give you the shiny tool syndrome, but just show you all the possibilities so you can pick the best option for you. And when I go to presentations, I see all these great things and I wanna try them all and then I get overwhelmed because there's so many. So our hope is that um, you'll set your intention and we'll talk about that shortly and just pick one or two things and stick with that. So this is kind of sparked from a uh, research project I did with kindergartners. This was in person and the joy that they had doing their projects and sharing their projects with other and a mix of ed tech and paper pencil and thinking about how can we continue to do this even if we aren't in person or if it's a hybrid approach. Um, what are some ed tech tools that could help us along the way? Give our students some voice and choice in what they're researching and also sharing it um, with others. Uh, while having fun with it. So this was inspired again from a kindergarten research project I did a few years ago um, with EdTech tools. So this is that slide I was talking about. So today, uh, what is your goal going to be for the day? Are you going to pick one tool? Are you going to think a little deeper about tech integration and how the, the programs work together? We're gonna talk a little bit about privacy because there's so many free apps and apps out there, but are they really free or what are they tracking? We'll talk about some pedagogy and mindset coming up. Um, so set an intention for the session and then we'll check back in at the end. And again, um, I wanna say that we've been doing this and our presentation might make it look easy peasy, but it's a messy process. So don't get discouraged if you try something and it doesn't work great the first time. We're showing you the best of what we've learned, but know that it wasn't perfect the first time we did it. Um, uh, I just wanted to share this article too. It's by um, The Cult of Pedagogy by Jennifer Gonzalez. And it's not specifically about the research process, but she points out nine things that should be different from face-to-face -face instruction. And it gave me something to think about and reflect on as we've been creating different 
um, resources to use in the classroom. And this presentation should be shared with you. I'll double check that it's all working as we go. Um, but our goal is to get it to you in your hands so you can have it and click on the links whenever you need. Oh, there we go. In the chat box, if you could share how you teach the research process in your classroom and remind us of what grade level you teach, please. So in the Pear Deck slide, or in the Pear Deck tab, you should see on the right side of your screen a chat box area where you can type in. This is what we would love to learn or learn about you. So I see on my teacher side using Pear Deck that I have four responses out of 14 people who are logged in with us. And again, if you just joined us and you're not in Pear Deck with us yet, I put the information in the chat so you can scroll up a little bit on how to get into our Pear Deck. So we're at about five of 14 responses. I'm going to share the responses. If you haven't started typing yet, it's OK. You can continue. So we see that we have a first grade teacher. Um, you've done many lessons as a whole class. Just getting back into it with seventh grade history. Pre-K, we start by figuring out what we want to learn and model. Um, in fourth grade, we talk about a few tips and find reliable sources. Um, when you teach K-6, yes, it really does depend on the grade level. <laughs> Um, some places the media special media specialists will teach it. We'll just wait here a little bit longer. So when they say media specialists, are they talking about their technology person, technology integration person, or is that somebody uh, completely different? So we in Minnesota sometimes we have a media specialist and sometimes we have a librarian, and sometimes they're the same. So if you are in that role, do you want to um, tell us more about your job description? The district that I came from had uh, media specialists. So they were housed in the library, and they were responsible for the library, but also some of the technology in the building. OK, let's keep going. Um, this is uh, an analogy from Dr. Marina Bears. She's out of Tufts University, and she talks about the digital technology that we use. What kind of environment are you creating for your kids? Are you creating a playground or a playpen? And when you think about playgrounds, you think of typically kids running around, collaborating, making choices, maybe working with other people, um, having that autonomy to, to explore what they're interested in. And then when you think of play pens, typically you think of a safe environment where kids are just doing what they're told. And it's okay for a little bit of time, but we don't really always want to live in that safe place that is very like restricted and that they're, they're limited in what they can do. So she connects that with the digital apps that we use in our classrooms and thinking about what apps do you use that allow more of a playground mentality and a play pen mentality. Um, so that's an analogy that I keep with me as I pick out different ed tech tools used with kids and why. Um, and she has a TED talk that she describes this more in depth that we linked on this slide. And um, I am making sure that you have access to this presentation. So you will have this after the session. I'm changing the share setting right now because right now it's anyone with the link can view, but um, maybe I'll just refresh it and see if that fixes it. Becky, did you want to add about the webinar? Uh, Marina Bears, she has a webinar tomorrow on developing computational thinking in, in early childhood. And I included the link. That way you can register for that if you'd like to. Great. Uh, some other models that we've thought about as we've done some of this um, ed tech integration to the research process are the technology integration matrix, SAMR, T3, TPAC, and the PTD framework. So if you're um, new to tech integration or you're looking for some more models and guidance on what to think about as you're picking tools and bringing them into the hands of your students, these are a few that we've used and we recommend that you check out. 
Okay, so the ISTE standards for students are designed to empower student voice and ensure that learning is a student dri driven process and you should use it to guide your lesson planning. And so I included that there, that way you can use that. Another thing to think about, we'll get into the research process soon, but we wanna make sure that we're also using apps that are um, safe for our students. So FERPA and COPA are two guidelines that um, you could look at as you're picking apps used with your students. If these are new things for you, you can learn more. Common Sense Media has a, a great page to help you learn more about privacy, what apps do with the information they have and how to pick apps that are safe for your students. So keep FERPA and COPA and the Student Privacy Pledge in mind as you think about apps. The ones that we're sharing today are ones that we've used. Doesn't necessarily mean that they align with the district that you work in and the privacy goals they have for you. So make sure you check that out before you would decide on it, on one to use. Okay, so now using Pear Deck again, um, we would like to know where do you think you are on the technology integration line? You should have the ability to click on a little dot and drag it along this line. Are you more of an emerging person or do you feel pretty advanced? Where do you think you would fall on this line? Try dragging a, a dot and showing us where you're at. So if you can see on the screen, it looks like we're pretty much all over the place. So that's great. So as we're sharing um, the resources and our thoughts, we want to hear from you um, if you've done these before, if you've used them before, what you've done with them. It looks like we have a lot to learn from each other. Okay, we also want to know how do you communicate with your students? Go ahead, Becky. <laughs> how do you share student work and foster collaboration online? This is also a pair deck and you should be able to use the draw uh, icons at the bottom to put check marks or circle. Um, which ones do you use to communicate with your students? So we're thinking about like, as we go through the research process, you need to share documents or resources back and forth with each other. What are some tools that you've used to do that? Or what are you planning to use this year? I'm gonna show the response, let's see. So in this feature, each person has their own slide and you can scroll through and see, look where they've clicked or drawn. Looks like Google Classroom and Seesaw are probably so far the only two. So the most two used tools, which is great because we're going to talk a lot about them today. If you're not sure you're undecided, maybe this session will help you decide. Schoology, I just saw Schoology. Cool. Okay, so we are going to talk a lot about Seesaw today. You, if you are just getting started with this and you want to focus on one tool, Seesaw is a tool that you could use for every step of the inquiry-based research process. If you've been using Seesaw for a while, or if you're ready to try Seesaw and something else, we'll also give you some other options. I've used Seesaw, whoops, I've used Seesaw um, as a co-teacher in a lot of elementary classrooms over the past few years. Um, and Becky's also used Seesaw. How have you used Seesaw, Becky? I've used Seesaw at as a parent, so on the parent perspective of what the teachers were giving to the to my of my kids, so that's how I used it. We want to know: Have you used CISA either as a parent or as a teacher? So again, in Pear Deck on the right side of your screen, we hope you see a yes or a no, and you could just click on one of those two. Great, I'm seeing responses come in. Let's see. So. Sorry. Oh, we're using Pear Deck today because we want to show you, a, we're modeling for you an interactive way for you to do a Google Meet session or a live session with your students. Uh, there's, they give you already pre-made slides and there's math, English language arts, and they have it from kindergarten all the way up. So you can find different slides to add yourself or you can make your own. And we just found it a great way for you to do something interactive while on a live session with your kids. Yeah. And if you, if you're, um, new to Pear Deck and you've never used it before, hopefully it will also help you understand like, is this a tool I'd want to use with my kids or not? So we're trying to give you that experience as well. 
So it looks like um, almost 50-50 having you see SAR or not. So that's great. We'll, we'll hopefully be able to learn from each other. So we will get started now. Go ahead. The first step in inquiry-based research is choosing a research question. This is where we brainstorm areas of interest. Usually in our classrooms, this is where we take out the anchor chart paper, we start writing on the dry erase board. But we want to give you different ideas on how to do this while having hybrid learning or online learning with your students. And so we're going to give you some ideas for that with EdTech tools. The first one is Seesaw. Of course, when your students are brainstorming ideas, you can have them take photos of their ideas if they write it on a piece of paper. They can also write it into the notepad. They can write using the drawing feature. They, re they can record their brainstorming ideas and upload them and give them to you. Or they can upload documents if they are able to do a Word document or a Google Doc. I just saw a question come in that was um, on Pear Deck. Have we never used it before? Can we explain how? If you stick around till the very end of the presentation, I'll share my screen with you um, so that you can see what Pear Deck looks like as we set it up. So we'll keep that for the end. Okay, so right now we're on a Google Meet session. And so I use Google Meets in my district. That's how we connect with our students. And one way that I used it was to have a live session on a theme for the week, and then I included a s'more with keep, uh, for the parents to find activities that they could go do at home. But how would you use this if you were brainstorming with your students? If you're with your students, you can take uh, use the extension or the add-on Jamboard, and you can write on that tool, and you can also have it where the kids can write on it as well. That way you can all brainstorm your ideas at the same time. Uh, s'more field trip. This is new. It's not out yet, but if you are a s'more, if you do have s'more, you'll be able to use it. And it's called s'more field trips. It is live, a live session, but it also could be um, re recorded. So at the end, when it's recorded, it gets put on your on your s'more account. It doesn't go into your Google. It doesn't go onto your desktop or anything like that. It goes into s'more, and they house all your recordings because they know that could take up a lot of space. What's nice is that you get all these links that we're providing for you today, you're wanting to click on it, but you can't if you're in this Pear Deck with us. But if you are on a field trip, people can click on the links that are there. And so they can go and see what the links are while you're presenting. You can also see when a student leaves your tab to go do something else on a different tab. Okay, now you can't see the kids and you can't hear the kids, but you can. they can type questions and then you can put the questions up on the screen. Um, you can also embed questions, just like if you were using Edpuzzle, if you've ever used Edpuzzle. Kids can rewind you, even if it's a live session, they can rewind you. And then they can go back to the live session part of it, or they can continue to watch you at the point where they're at. But they can never fast forward you unless they're watching you and it's already been recorded. Um, Great. If you're having younger kids, there are emojis that they can click on if they don't, if they can't type. Um, just as a check-in, if you joined us a little bit after we started at 12, we're using Pear Deck, and Pear Deck is a tool that allows us to ask questions and get your feedback as we go. Um, so if you've never used Pear Deck before, I think Emily just put into the chat the pd.com slash um, how to join, and then the, the code to join the session you'll see in the upper right corner of my screen right here. Um, so that you can answer as we go. Uh, another tool that you could use as you're working with students to choose a research question is Nearpod. I've used it when we're together in the classroom where I can have um, slides and I can advance through the slides and when I turn the page or go to the next slide, it goes to the next slide for my students. And I haven't yet used the feature to do a live session plus Zoom, so I'm curious if anyone else has used that feature yet and how it went if you've used it. Um, but I've done it in person in the classroom and it's worked great. So we thought this might be another great way to maybe introduce students to different areas of research and then ask them what they'd like to research and gather their feedback either through multiple choice, text response, uh, draw response, um, a poll. So there's a lot of options built into it. And on the slides as we're going, you'll notice we try to have some helpful resources for you. So if you've never used that tool before, there's either maybe a YouTube video or the website has um, links to getting started. 
The second step in inquiry-based research is search for the information. This is where you identify the keywords to drive your research. You then you select re reliable resources, articles, magazines, books. And when I think of this part, I think about when I was a kid and going into the library and going to find the Encyclopedia Britannica and looking up dinosaur. But we want to give you, again, something more exciting, more engaging, and something that the kids can do at home. I just added the directions to join our Pear Deck, if you'd like, into the chat again. OK, so we have a question. What's the difference between Nearpod and Pear Deck? Let's save that for the end when we show you how we set up Pear Deck. And then you can see how it's set up and how it's different. Okay, again, Seesaw can be used throughout the five steps of inquiry-based research. And here what we have is a choice board. So you have all the places that kids can go look for the research, Pepple Go, Tumble Books, Epic, and they can just click there and it takes them straight there. And that's just an easy resource for them to find their books that they need. And if you're new to Seesaw or thinking about wanting to use Seesaw, they just put out some PD within the last two weeks, I think it was, at community.seesaw.me. And I took um, about an hour long course on how to create choice boards in Seesaw. So if that's something of interest to you, you can go to their website and do this whole course on creating choice boards like Becky has on this picture here. And it was created by a Minnesota educator, so that's pretty neat. Okay, so again, in the second step, it's going out and searching for information and doing your research. So um, Pebble Go is a product that I used when I was in the classroom a few years ago, but it's also where I work now. So obviously, I think it's a great tool. Um, and then Pebble Go Next is for kids a little bit older. So Pebble Go would be about kindergarten through second, third grade. Pebble Go Next is about third grade on up. And Pebble Go Next is getting revamped. So a new version will come out in about 10 days. Um, so if you'd like to get started with it and try it for free, I have a username and password that you can use to explore all of the different modules and features. But this is what Pebble Go looks like. So instead of sending a kindergartner out to Google to do research on storms, they can go into Pebble Go and they get these different articles and they're read to kids um, by a person's voice, not just a computer voice. There's pictures, there's videos, there's books about reading more. So if they're really into into this and they want to then read an ebook about it, it will suggest some books for them. Um, if you're teaching them how to cite their sources, because it's a research project, there's a button that will help them understand how to cite that source. And then there's activities to continue their learning. So this I mentioned at the very beginning, I used Pebble Go in a kindergarten classroom and we were doing animal research projects and a student created one on the Arctic fox. And uh, I'll show you a video later about what it looked like in the end. But we used a mix of Pebble Go to do our research, and then we had paper to write down some facts. And then Capstone Interactive is an ebook platform. And again, here's a username and password if you want to try it out. These will be good until the end of September. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show you. This is the person in Minnesota who you could reach out to for more information about sales and getting accounts. But a really neat thing is Minitex just purchased the Pebble Go database for, um, I think it's biographies and animals for all kids in the state of Minnesota for free. So you're, if you don't have Pebble Go right now, you can start using Pebble Go for free with your kids on those two databases. And you can reach out to Mackenzie to get that started. It's for the next three years it's free for you. Um, and it just happened let's see, July 14th. So it's a it's a, a new purchase. Yay, I see Beth clapping. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So that's for Pebble Go and Pebble Go Next, there were also two more modules purchased. So um, if you're new to it, jump right in with those usernames and passwords that I gave you here. Um, again, this presentation is open for you. So you can start trying it out now. And then once you're able to connect with Mackenzie, you can get accounts for your, for your schools or districts um, and really start to build some curriculum with it. So um, another tool is one that Becky will share with you. So I'm going to share Epic, but you have Capstone there. That will go next <laughs> for three years for free. So uh, this is a free resource that you can use. And um, it also reads the story to the kids. And you can make collections for your kids. And you can differentiate it depending on what level you need. And you can share your, um, your collections with your students. 
Okay, so the third step in um, inquiry-based research is organize the information. This is where we're gonna select the research format and your components, and the kids organize the information into the categories. They use take notes and organize, uh, use graphic organizers, and they use paragraph frames. And um, I, this is where I remember my teacher having a piece of paper and, and making a, a mind map and putting introduction and what details I wanted in my introduction and everything. But we're gonna give you different ways for your students to store their information and organize it. And so you can always use Seesaw. Now we have paper-based um, graphic organizers. We can make those exact same graphic organizers on Seesaw for our students and they can uh, sit there and they can write or they can draw or do anything they need to on their graphic organizer straight on Seesaw. I teach uh, mostly upper grades in elementary, and so Google, I use the Google Drive and Google Classroom to store information, and so our kids will make a folder, and they'll share that folder with me in their Google Classroom. That's just another way for them to store information. They can do um, slides, they could do a doc, um, they can also record information and send it to you as well. A tool that I was just recently introduced to is Buncee. And I read a blog post about how Shannon Miller used Buncee with Pebble Go to do research projects with little with young children. And um, that's a, one of the helpful resources here is how she laid it out. Um, and you can add a lot of fun pictures and details to your research journal, or you could keep it very simple, just looking like a piece of paper. But if you wanna learn more about all of the steps she took, that could be a whole webinar in itself. So I'll just point you to her Van Meter Library Voice, her blog post. The fourth step in inquiry-based research is prepare the final research. This is where they're gonna revise and edit their information and they're gonna finalize their uh, works cited page and they're gonna include a self-reflection. And so we have some ed tech tools here that will help with that. So at this point, they've, they've thought about what they wanna research, they picked their question, they went out and did their research, they have all their information. So now they're going to take what they've learned and create that presentation. So they're preparing that final research. And one of the tools that both Becky and I have used is Scratch Junior. And Scratch Junior was made for young children, um, early to non-readers, so pre-K even to about second, third grade. Maybe at around second, third grade, you'd wanna jump up to Scratch, but um, we've both worked a lot with Scratch Junior. So we chose to talk about how you could take your research project and bring it into Scratch Junior and you can animate different characters. They can, um, they can have text bubbles, they can record their voice. You can have four different scenes. So you could present it first, then next, last, or one fact, second fact, third, and fourth. Um, what else do you wanna say about Scratch Junior, Becky? It's a great resource. There's, uh, they have 15 different languages. So if you have a diverse group of students, um, I moved to Boston to work with it because I feel like it's that great of a resource and it's free um, and you can use it on an iPad or a Chromebook. Right. Um, yeah, we'll keep going. <laughs> um, Pick Collage EDU. So in this picture on the right, um, I want you to think about what were we researching or studying during this lesson? We had our sensory bins out and we used Pit Collage EDU for kids to take a picture of the sensory bin and then label different objects within the sensory bin. So we were, we were learning about plants and different parts of a plant in the life cycle. And this was a fun way for kids to take what we were doing with our hands and bring it online and show what they learned about the different parts of it. And then this is that um, animal research project that I absolutely loved and always think of whenever I think of our research projects. Um, it's from a few years ago. And a few years ago, I used an app called Yak It Kids to create it, but that app hasn't been updated for a while. Um, so another app I've used is called ChatterPix. And it allows you, if you look on the screen, you see the different steps in the process. It allows you to take a picture and draw a mouth anywhere you want on the picture and then record your voice. And then you can add stickers if you want. So in the example in the upper right corner, there's a picture, picture of a fox. It's a YouTube video. So um, a student recorded themselves telling you the facts they learned about the Arctic fox. And as they talk, the mouth of the talk fox. The, the, <laughs> the mouth of the fox talks. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> um, and it's 
it's really fun um, and it was a great way for kids to share what they researched and learned with each other. Another fun tool I used is Toontastic. And in this example, we had um, kids researching a problem they saw at their school and how they thought they could fix it. So they had to come up with something that bothered them and then create a solution for it. And in this example, there were, there were some girls who were convinced that only older kids should be able to sit in the back of the bus for safety reasons. So they had to come up with their reasons why, and they chose to create a video in Toontastic and it helped them with their story arc. So it helped them lay it out. And they had pre-made characters, but they could also create their own characters. And then they also had to pick a setting. So uh, it's a tool, I think Google acquired it. So it's now free. I, I'm pretty sure it was because I never really had a budget. Um, so it was a tool that we used to have kids share their presentations. The final step in the inquiry-based research is present and share the final research. This is the most exciting part because you get to share it with everybody. And so what are different ed tech tools you can use to share your final research project? Um, of course, Seesaw, students can record. What I In this one, students uploaded a PowerPoint or a Google slide, and then they recorded going through their slide in Seesaw. And when you say record, what do you mean record? Okay, so they can record their voice. Right. They can record themselves. But in this one, you want to record the voice because you want to show the PowerPoint. Awesome. Um, so another tool that both Becky and I have used is the Dash Robot. And that was great when we were in person and our students were working together. They got to touch the robot, the robot got to move. But now, in our current state of education, is that really something that we'll be able to do? Or will everyone be able to do that? There's a lot of things to think about. How will we clean the robot? How will we encourage coding and programming? Um, so in this image here, you can see that some of, we would start with writing out our, our story and our research, and then students had a big piece of paper and they had to make a map and plot different things along the way to support their story and their research. Um, and then they would use iPads to program the robot down this mat. But that might not happen this year. It might have to look different. So Wonder Workshop came out with a platform online using, I think it's Class Connect. It's called Dash's Neighborhood. So you can still program a robot in an online world. Um, so you don't have to have that physical robot with you. But if you have it, you can do both. But you don't have to do both. You could just do it online. And Becky just went to that Infosys training, what, like two weeks ago, was it? Last week or two weeks ago? Will you, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you learned there? Well, I learned about the class, uh, Dash's Neighborhood with Class Connect. And it takes you through the same curriculum that they have when if you're using the actual robot, except for it's all with Dash's Neighborhood. So when they program it, the simulator starts Dash. And so they can run through all that, but they can also program a Dash, let's say if they have it at home, through Dash's neighborhood, and then they can upload the code and it'll go into the robot and, and the robot will move. Or if they're using the robot and they want to share the code with everyone else, they can use do it through Class Connect and share the code with everyone and then everybody can run it through their simulator. So if you're like us and you've used robots in the past and now you're trying to figure out what that will look like this year, this is one place you can check out to see if it meets your needs. Flipgrid. So with my sixth graders, we use a lot of Flipgrid because they like to see themselves and record themselves. And so uh, the students have, you can do a video of up to 10 minutes so they can record their presentation um, on Flipgrid and then other students in the class can actually um, respond, peer respond with the video um, about their presentation. And you can even upload videos. So if you would do a Chatter Pick Kid video, instead of them recording themselves right in front of the camera like you see here, they could upload that ChatterPix video. They work well with a lot of other ed tech tools. So like Buncee is another one they work well with. Uh, Book Creator is an app that I've used. I've used the free version where you just get one book and the paid version where you can get multiple books. But what's really cool about Book Creator is kids are creating their own ebook and they can bring in text and pictures and drawings they can record their voice and there's a little arrow on the side of the screen so you turn the page like you would turn the page in a book and then you can easily share it into something like 
Seesaw or Google Classroom. So it's, it gives the students a way to present their product to their peers. Kid blog. Uh, Kid blog is another way for them to share their final draft, even a rough draft they could share here. And so my students uh, were reading Prince and the Pauper and they had to share uh, the, difference be the differences between the Prince and the Pauper. And what you see there on the right hand side is them going back and peer reviewing their stu uh, the work. So they're actually editing. This isn't the final one. They're editing the work and you can, the kids after they want uh, share the revision to the other kids' work, you can accept whether or not you want to share it with them, or you can have it where it just shares automatically. And you can also post grades in there for the kids and no one else will see it. And you can post reviews as well. The kids get to upload their own picture to go with it. And it's just a good, good way for them to uh, peer review each other. Okay, so we've come to the end of the our presentation. And just looking back, we talked about the five different steps to inquiry-based research, starting from choosing a research question to sharing the information, organizing the information, preparing the final research, and presenting the final research. And so we want you to think back to the beginning of the session, what your intention was, and did that intention stay or did it change throughout? We're just curious um, what stuck with you and what is something you're going to, to try after today. So go ahead and type your response. Um, in the Pear Deck. You don't have to put your name if you don't want to. We just are curious what people are taking away from the presentation. Um, yay, Pebble Go. So who's ever typing Pebble Go, um, let me know if you want to connect because I get to work with that tool every day now. So you could uh, reach out to me later if you'd like. Uh, the S'more Field Trip, on the slide for S'more Field Trip, I included the professional development that they had on the product. So if you click on that, you could watch the whole thing with the instructor. S'more Field Trip and Jamboard, Kid Blog, um, Flipgrid. So hearing about it from multiple people. What's really cool about Flipgrid too is it started here in Minnesota as a startup down in the cities, down by not far from Target Field and then Microsoft acquired them. So it's been a pretty cool ed tech tool to watch grow. Yay, more Pebble Go. It seems like everything starts in Minnesota. Yeah, Minnesota is a pretty great place. <laughs> <laughs> Minnesota, Iowa. <laughs> nope, just Minnesota. <laughs> well, Pear Deck's from Iowa, Iowa City, Iowa. Oh, really? So Midwest. Yes, hot, guys. <laughs> Way to go, Midwest. <laughs> okay, so thank you for attending the last 45 minutes with us. Um, we'll all stop the Pear Deck session. So if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. But while we do that, I'll also share my screen with you so you can see what it looks like in a Google Slides to add the Pear Deck add-on so that you can understand if it's a tool that you'd want to use too. Um, so both Becky and I will uh, point out some features. So feel free to um, join us back inside of the, the Google Meet. We're in a meet, right? Yep, a meet, not a hangout. In the meet and type your questions there. I'm going to switch to this screen and share the screen with you. Let's see, too many screens right now. Present see a window nope a tab chrome tab i want to share this tab with you perfect okay so this is what my screen looks like so we created this presentation together in google slides and then um, when you're in a google slide you have the option for add-ons and you have to go and get the add-on for Pear Deck. But once you add the Pear Deck add-on, you'll always see it right here. So when, I'm gonna just X out so that you can see. So this is just like, looks like a regular Google Slides. But if you want to add in features like we did here, like you can see the write your responses, you can go to add-ons and then you can start your Pear Deck. So you'll open a Pear Deck add-on. And then as you're working through your session, if you want to build in that formative assessment, you have these different ways to um, ask your students questions. We, I only have the free version right now. When you get started, you get the premium features, but then it runs out after a certain amount of time, and then you can pay for them if you'd like. But it's as simple as, we'll just pick our title slide. So right now there's no Pear Deck. You don't see any Pear Deck features on here. But if we wanted to, have you add some text, we just click on that button. 
and then it will ask you, do you really want to update it to add that Pear Deck feature? Yes, we do. So now it's adding that interactive feature. And so now we have the option for when we launch our Pear Deck for our students to um, write a response. So someone before asked the difference between Pear Deck and Nearpod. And so this is how I see the difference. Nearpod is um, an app that I'm going to go to and I'm going to run everything that I'm doing within Nearpod itself. And that's where I start. Or I could create a Google Slides and then I could use the Nearpod add-on and go to Nearpod and use it. I don't know if that's making a lot of sense. But Pear Deck is like right here within Google Slides and it's like added right on top of it. So and I I'm use both. Do you want to add in the chat what I just said? Go ahead, Becky. I know that you're using a Mac, right? I am using a Mac. So on my PC, okay, it does not have where I go to add-ons and it shows my add-ons. When it's Pear Deck, there is a little pair and it says Pear Deck right on the toolbar, right there for Google Slides. So then you can just click right on there. Um, I actually have, I have the premium version with my uh, district account. And it's amazing. I use it all the time. I also use the Google Be Internet Awesome curriculum, and it all, it's all with Pear Deck integrated into it. And so it's really a good uh, resource to use. What is the Google Internet Be Awesome curriculum? What is it teaching us? <laughs> We're doing really good today. It's like a tongue twister. <laughs> okay, it's 12.45. Um, any more questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question or write it in the type it in the chat. Uh, we'll hang out a little bit longer and see if anyone has questions. Um, I'll put my email in the chat as well in case you are going to be a Pebble Go person and you want to reach out to me about that or anything, not just about Pebble Go. I'm just really excited about Pebble Go right now. So thank you for coming. Enjoy your lunch. I have um, leftover pizza, <laughs> which is a weekly thing for me <laughs> this summer. <laughs> Order pizza probably Sunday nights and then eat pizza for the week. <laughs> Not the healthiest. Thank you for coming. Bye, Beth. Bye, Kelsey. Bye, Emily. Thanks for coming.